Um, welcome and thank you f uh, for coming out this evening um, for our first lecture of 2024. Um, it's great to see a good crowd. We're in a new space. Um, so thank you all for making the trek out tonight. Um, for those of you who do not know, um, I'm Ross Miller. Um, been involved, uh, kind of running the lecture series with um, AI Omaha and AI Nebraska for many years. Um, I also have a nonprofit, uh, Maple Street Construct, which we've taken over the lecture series um, now. Um, and we're a creative run nonprofit arts organization um, located here in Benson. Um, our mission is to provide programming free to everyone as a public service to elevate the creative discourse in the communities that we serve. Uh, we also serve a critical role in the promotion and presentation of art, design, and the built environment by bridging the discourse between outside and local cultural conventions with the community of Omaha and beyond. Um, I also want to give a big uh, sh uh, shout out to Matt Reimer. I think he's back there somewhere. Um, with Cold Spring, they're uh, tonight's evening, uh, this evening's food and beverage hosts. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Matt and Cold Spring, for uh, keeping uh, us, our tummies filled and the drinks flowing. Um, I did tell Matt to leave the, the, the bar tab open during uh, the talk. So um, if you need to refreshen up, please do so. Um, but again, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Cold Spring. Um, really appreciate it. If you don't get, ch if you haven't had a chance, please uh, talk to Matt before you head out. Um, they're doing some great work um, with the granite. Um, they've got a lot of projects going on here in Omaha. Um, I also want to give thanks to AI Nebraska. Um, they serve as our partner in this design lecture series, um, as well as a thank you to our sponsors for their support of this series. Um, though they're trickling through on the TVs here. Um, we have, I think, 13 sponsors this year, so um, we really appreciate that. Um, and we're also, um, you know, thankful for the Benson Creative District, newly formed, um, them and the Nebraska Arts Council and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment um, for their funding support for the lecture series this year. Um, also, thank you to Benson Theater. All of our lectures will be here this year. Um, so they've uh, been great so far, and I'm looking forward to Jonathan's talk here in a little bit. Um, it's a great venue, great space. Um, Benson's uh, and Omaha's, uh, it's, it's great to have a space like this to host these types of events. Um, okay, a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you're an architect and you need CEU credits, um, please scan the sheets with the QR codes for AI Nebraska. I have them up at the bar. Um, they can be a little tricky with your iPhone, turn your brightness all the way up and stand like five to 10 feet away and it should work. We figured out, so they will take you to a form, fill that out. That's how AI Nebraska um, prefers it to be done these days. Um, and then I also just please ask you to take the attendee survey, uh, another QR code. It's uh, way more, way easier to, uh, to scan with your phone, but it allows um, the Benson Creative District to kind of uh, capture some data and metrics um, on those who are attending for future grant and funding opportunities uh, for the community here in Benson. Um, so please do that on your way out. Um, and then I also have some posters that I printed up um, that list all of the lectures, their dates. Um, it's, uh, it's orange, it's on the bar, so please take some um, home with you, back to your office, please post, put those up, um, help spread the word. Um, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, with all that out of the way, I'm going to introduce uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Tate is a principal of OJT, Office of Jonathan Tate, an architecture and urban design practice in New Orleans. Along with their conventional architectural practice, the office engages in numerous design-related activities, including applied research, opportunistic planning, and strategic development. 
The work has received numerous awards, including National AIA ha uh, Housing Awards and the National AIA Honor Awards in Architecture. The office has been recognized as, as an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York, a next progressive by Architecture Magazine, and a finalist for the International Architecture Review Emerging Architect Award. Jonathan is the recipient of the award in architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is a graduate of Auburn University where he was a participant at the Rural Studio, as well as a Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He has taught at Tulane University, the Cooper Union, and was most recently the Favreau Visiting Professor at Tulane University. So please uh, welcome Jonathan to the stage. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here tonight, and thank you, Ross and Mabel Street Construct, and your and your partners for having me here uh, to speak. So I'm excited to, to be here this evening, and I thought I might emphasize too that the bar tab is still open. So if y'all want to get up and make your way over there, I will not be offended. I'll understand exactly what you're up to. I promise. Um, okay. <clears throat> See if I can kind of get here. Thank you all for welcoming me here from New Orleans uh, to be here and talk to you all about our office uh, and the work that we do. The um, start off, uh, if, just to kind of dive into this, uh, a little bit about the practice just to give some context around who we are and what what uh, the office was kind of established around. And this is a graphic that I often show. It's it's ancient now, but uh, but it's something that we pulled together right as the right as the office started to formulate around 2011, basically. And I will say that uh, I, I was, at the time, uh, a transplant to New Orleans. I moved there in 2008. I had been uh, in the city off and on uh, from 2006 onward, and that was, if you'll recall, right after Katrina. And we were there intentionally to engage in the work that was happening, relocated our practice ourselves and everything just to be down there and be a part of that environment. And it was life-changing in, in a lot of ways. but. It, it had a profound impact, I'll say, on the, on the way practice, uh, or what, rather, I should say, what practice meant uh, for us and what, uh, for me specifically, and, and what we were trying to accomplish with, with an office in this particular environment. And what that means for us, essentially, is, is that, I mean, we are, you know, for all practical purposes, a conventional architectural practice. We're, you know, provide services for, for clients, uh, architectural services for clients and other things, but mixed in that, is a desire to sort of expand uh, not not just the projects that we're working on, but the uh, other opportunities that we see that are running tangentially, let's say, to work that we might have on the boards, if you will. Um, but also things that we were interested in and, and felt like we had some uh, way of engaging in whether we were asked to or not. And, and I'll get into that a little bit as we move on. But with that, also uh, the office had sort of ambitions around scale. And so you can see the kind of gradations here around thinking about regional design and what that meant, planning often, but architectural planning really all the way down to very specific and small scale work. And as an office, I will say that we work on a pretty broad range of projects. They um, I, hard to remember some of the things that we've that we've been involved with, but anywhere from you know museums, which are, are great galleries and so forth, so sort of art related work to more public projects um, uh, with uh, communities, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, you know, cities and so forth, working on public works with them. Uh, with entities like that, but then also, you know, as the diagram says, look, working at like a regional scale with uh, organizations that, that care about more than just a building, but larger sort of footprint. And, and I say all that basically uh, as a way of saying what I'm getting ready to show you is a lot of single family houses. So it's not, that's not all that we do, but I would say that that's really like the heart of where our practice is intellectually. And um, and for us, it's expansive, which is sort of the, the reason for us to say a house is housing. And we, we care deeply about housing, uh, the role of housing as, uh, you know, as, as a city maker in a lot of ways, but, but also how it works in the, you know, the psychology and sociology of, of us and, and how we live in the world. And 
in, in the troubles that we're having with housing today in particular and in, in how architecture can engage in that or architects can engage in that and our role in, uh, uh, in, in developing and advancing that in positive ways. So th this is a, a talk that I kind of organize around a house or house is and with the idea that thinking about an indiv individual home is a way of thinking about uh, housing writ large, let's say. So what I'm going to walk through is just a series of, of projects. And <clears throat> uh, what I often start with is a, a project that began a long time ago now in 24, now 10 years ago in 2014. Uh, but I continue to talk about because I think it's uh, really the project that more than anything, I would say, both defines our practice, but but is also kind of represents the aspirations of our office. And uh, and by that, I mean it's sort of a total project for us, right, and as I get through this. So uh, what, what started out, and again, this was in 2014, and I'll kind of tell this as a narrative. We were, uh, you know, post-recession, let's say 2008, um, sort of come and gone. Uh, around 2012, we started to see our own housing market, which was, I think, a little late in the game, started to uh, overheat. And by the time 24, 2014 came around, it was like housing for most of us was a real challenge, or, or finding housing for most of us was affordable housing, I should say, uh, or attainable housing was a real challenge. But at the same time, you know, we were seeing things in our own environment that made us kind of challenge some of the, the uh, you know, conventional notions of what, in, in what development looked like, housing development looked like, but what opportunities really meant. Uh, in an urban environment. And so this is the sort of holes in the city, cracks in the market. This is us sort of observing and, and saying to ourselves that there are opportunities. And, and also acknowledging the, the, uh, the other actors that are involved in, uh, or the primary actors, I should say, that are involved in creating housing uh, in, in most communities. And that's certainly speculative development uh, when you think about rental housing, but also for sale housing, but also the real estate industry and how you know, their aversion to risk, if you will, create a, a market that, you know, we saw often as homogenized. I think we could all sort of recognize that in, in the products that get produced. Uh, and, and we just imagined that there was, in fact, a market for something beyond that. Um, but as I said, you know, development itself, uh, real estate development itself is, is, as they say, risky business. Um, and we were, you know, trying to be deferential to the pressures that are on the in these industries that we're being critical about uh, and, and their role and reasons for doing what they do. But, but also trying to, you know, look at sort of the basic principles of what development is, especially at the scale that I'm getting ready to talk about. It's pretty straightforward stuff, right? Like I think, you know, we're all intelligent people. We can kind of figure it out. It's just a matter of like getting into it and, and a willingness to kind of understand it and adapt to it. Um, and if for some reason my slides disappear. So there will be some things that disappear in all this. Forgive me. The, uh, but, but also thinking about us as architects, and the lineage of, of architecture and design and single family housing in particular and, and how, you know, we certainly do custom homes and that's important to us as, as, as architects and, and there's always opportunities to be creative and, and create uh, extraordinary things in that realm, but we kind of lost interest in the sort of workaday housing that I think, you know, if you look back, uh, we, we had a role in and, and had a formative role in. Uh, over over time that, that has again has just faded and all, all that's to say is like through this process um, we eventually kind of came down to and, and this was you know it didn't happen in 2014 this happened in 2020 basically where we were able to sort of put put down on paper the what we were after what we were trying to do what the actual agenda was and I'm not going to read it here but you know we had this kind of set of criteria that like this is important to us uh, as a topic, and I'll explain what, what I mean by that in a second, and this was our agenda, if you will, if we were to try to sort of move forward and see if there wasn't something we could do, uh, or, or rather something we could say about the state of housing at the time. Um, so w what it meant to engage in this for us was sort of three, I'll call it twofold, threefold. Um, one was it was an intellectual project. So when you saw that first diagram and I say that we're really interested in, in investigations or research, this was some a way for us to sort of dig in and speculate on um, what we saw as possibilities that were topical, right? It wasn't just New Orleans. This was something that was happening across the nation. 
And what we wanted to do was speculate uh, on, on it in a, in a broader way, right? So this wasn't just about a New Orleans problem, this was about you know problems that were affecting every city in the country at the time. And so we went about talking about, okay, where we saw opportunities in different locations from Atlanta uh, to Burlington to you know Austin and, and onward Boston and so forth. And, and a lot of that had to do with uh, where, where we saw possibilities in land development and, and missed opportunities for uh, how we use uh, the the resources of our communities, and so it, it moved from a, a study around what how we might engage in other communities into a real like okay if we're going to look at this like let's think about how we might uh, you know take this agenda and apply it to our own community uh, of New Orleans, and so this is a, a map of New Orleans that you'll probably see this figure a few times tonight in the work that I'm showing, but um, the just for reference this is the French Quarter and the CBD, and then the river that you're seeing here in the lake to the north. And um, what we started doing was actually doing an analysis of vacant land in our city. And so this is a map looking at uh, where vacant parcels existed uh, in the city. So uh, again, we weren't interested in renovation. We were interested in looking at land development, uh, so new construction essentially, but like looking for you know new sites, if you will, and where those existed in our city. And through that process, we evolved into like, okay, now that we found these sites, let's start categorizing them some way. And so this was a, a kind of layering of uh, a neighborhood name, a zoning analysis, a, a quantity of uh, vacant lots and parcels in a, in a particular neighborhood, and then proximity to downtown. So this is sort of a, a spread of you know, what, what we saw as uh, available parcels. And through this filtering, so we were just kind of working our way through this process, which now is kind of routine. I think there are programs that you can do this. At the time, we were writing scripts and like running, you know, downloading all the data we could from the assessor overnight, and then we'd have these long spreadsheets that we would then kind of filter everything through afterwards. And this filtering process over, you know, several weeks of us just kind of analyzing this turned into uh, kind of a recognition of uh, of a certain kind of property that we we thought was. Uh, uh, represented the opportunity that that was uh, available to us in the city of New Orleans and what what we ended up calling these odd lots are essentially uh, uh, non-conforming parcels so these are little pieces of land in the city that had not been developed but were legal parcels of land and so we we sifted all of these out you know this is the shape of them all if you will and there were roughly a little over 5,000 of them that were within a certain zone. I think there are lots more of them if you just looked out uh, over the broader sort of spectrum of the city, but it, in in our case, just looking specifically at <coughs> uh, a certain distance from downtown, like the historic core, if you will, this is what we were able to come up with. And, you know, as we say, they come in all shapes and sizes. And some, some of these are buildable, some of them aren't. But again, these were all parcels that, in theory, were available for development. And they, you know, they were triangles and medians. They were old alleyways. Uh, they were parcels that got bisected because of new right-of-way that had gone through and so forth. But they were, you know, they were interesting. They were just like, hey, look, this is compelling stuff. Let's see what we can make out of it. And, and as we started looking at it closer, it's like, the, the realities around us actually implementing this idea, like literally implementing it, started to become more real. And we we thought about, okay, if we're going to do some of these, let's look at, you know, where we might be able to concentrate our efforts. Why do one when you can do 20 or 30 in one neighborhood? And so this was kind of a study of where clusters were, just to show you. Um, and we, we ended up kind of settling on one neighborhood in particular. It's called the Irish Channel. Uh, it's it's roughly a mile away from the historic core, but along the river, which is uh, the neighborhood itself was developed in the, I think the 1850s is when this was kind of platted as part of the city. Uh, but when we looked at it, there were roughly, I think, 28 properties uh, that were, fit our criteria, if you will. Um, and as I said, we were kind of vacillating between this as some kind of thought project that we were, you know, spending time on that we probably shouldn't have been and something that we wanted to actually, you know, do. Like, okay, what, what and how, you know, this might work. Um, and there's a lot of backstory here that I'm just going to kind of skip over. But like the people that are involved is primarily our office, but we had partners that we were working with, uh, both on the real estate side, but importantly on the development side. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that there were, you know, roughly 30 parcels in this particular neighborhood, like, well, let's see if we can buy them. And so we went through this process of trying to buy every one of them. So we solicited each of the, 
each of the property owners and went through the whole sort of uh, uh, series of, you know, can we get them, can we not get them? And then, you know, eventually we ended up, uh, we ended up with one, which I'll talk about in a second. But, but this agenda kind of over the lifespan, and again, this started in around 2014, ended around 2019, 2020, uh, we were able to work on 17 total projects, which I'll, or 17 total houses, I should say, uh, across five different projects. The number one was the lot, I'll show in a second, that came from that initial, like, let's go try to buy some property. Uh, and then uh, two and three, four through 15 and 16 and 17 all evolved uh, uh, after that one. But the first project that we worked on <clears throat> was 3106 St. Thomas. And this was what I call the sort of quintessential site for us. It was, uh, again, small piece of property. It was one of those that, uh, one of the 30 or so that we tried to, that we tried to purchase. Uh, it was the only one that we were able to buy that fit, you know, our kind of odd lot uh, parameters. It was owned by a developer who, if anyone's been involved in uh, trying to purchase property, they tend to be the most reasonable and level-headed about property, you know, for a property owner. Uh, happy to get rid of it. Uh, we bought this lot, which was 45 feet, sorry, 55 feet deep, 16 feet wide. That till, when I say a small lot, that's, this was a pretty small lot for us. Um, a, a typical lot in New Orleans, for reference, is 30 by 120. We, we have uh, around a 3,600, I think 3,600 square foot minimum for a conforming lot if you were to subdivide. And we've got some dimensional uh, requirements and the 30 feet by uh, 120 is kind of a typical lot for us with our block structure the way it is. Uh, but this lot again was uh, 16 and a half feet, that half foot is important, by, uh, by 55 feet long. They, um, uh, as I'm going to have to move quick through some of this stuff because I'm trying to show a lot of material, but each of these are, are really a phenomenal story. I have to say like this, just to start out like this one lot for us to find it, like you can certainly locate it through an assessor's site and you see that it's a parcel. When you go out there, it's in the little image that you see uh, in the up, upper right there, it's like it did not look like anything. In fact, the, there was a fence in front of the lot itself. The neighbor uh, behind it or next to it had kind of taken it over par as part of their yard. So there was no real identifiable characteristics in that. That was a lot of what this was about is like actually driving around to try to find these parcels. A lot of times you couldn't, but you knew legally speaking that it, it existed. And so, uh, so when we started out, kind of located, got it, it's great, it's our small lot. And then a uh, whole sort of process that we went through in order to develop this initial one. Um, I, I will say a lot of this work is in full historic districts for us. So this is a, uh, these are designated historic uh, neighborhoods. Uh, there's a, a fairly elaborate process that we go through uh, with, with a peer review and then a full commission review. Everything's public. Um, and, uh, you know, we have fairly stringent historic uh, uh, guidelines that we have to follow, we have to comply with, and so forth. And th this project, and as I say, a number of the other ones you're going to see tonight, all had to comply with that. So there was that process that we were working through, but, but there was also the kind of zoning regulation piece that right out of the beginning we thought this is too narrow to build a house on. We need to be able to move beyond our, our required setbacks, which are three feet on either side. Uh, we went to the uh, zoning board to try to, to ask for this variance in this case and, and, and showed up and there was a whole room full of neighborhood people that were there to oppose us. So, um, and, and, you know, hence everything else that you see is also uh, as of right. And we were just like, okay, I guess we're not going to be able to argue with people over this. But um, so we're just going to try to kind of move through as it is. And, and, and in this case, what we ended up producing was a project, again, that complies fully with the zoning ordinances in this case. Uh, three foot setbacks on either side, which left us a ten and a half foot wide house, so about nine and a half feet on the end. Well, let's say about nine feet clear on the inside, uh, and, and very vertical. So it's a three story home that we're trying to fit within this kind of slot site. This is the completed project. Uh, we finished in I'd say around 2015, maybe 2016. We designed it. We were the developer for it, along with a partner, and then our partner and ourselves built it. So it was the whole thing. We put it out there, and it was spec. We didn't have a client. We didn't have anybody. We just put it out there, um, which in, in many ways, coming back to the risky business piece of it, all of a sudden you realize why people do things that are safe. 
uh, this project sat for a year or so, basically, without any buyers, essentially. And, uh, and, and although, you know, there, a lot of people were very interested in the project and it, it generated other work for our office, uh, the market that we speculated on was perhaps a little thinner than we thought. Uh, at least initially, but uh, but lesson learned, and, and the project sold actually to a young couple that moved in. Uh, uh, you know, once they, you know, that while that it sat on there, and as I said, it's it's a vertical home. It's actually uh, 975 square feet total. It's uh, uh, two and a half stories, let's say, uh, two bedrooms, one and a half bath, essentially, was the setup. And, and a goal here was to create a livable house. We weren't interested in creating tiny homes, even though the lots were small. The point was, is like you can still put a normal home on a small lot through, you know, the creative energy and, and, and wherewithal, let's say, of, of our profession, or at least of, of architects in general. And so this was it when it was completed uh, before it sold. Um, I'm going to work through the rest of these projects now kind of quickly. The, the second one was interesting. So as we finished the first one, some people took note. They, they were interested in these small lots. Uh, it's like, wow, you can build on these things. That's fascinating. We, we actually purchased that lot for $25,000. Uh, we could have sold it before we went to, uh, before we started construction for maybe $40,000, $45,000. So it you know, appreciated pretty quickly in the time we were just planning. Tells you something about the neighborhood. But today, just for reference, a lot like this down the street, which I watched sell, went for two hundred thousand dollars, like two twenty-five in that range. Uh, if you can find a, in these neighborhoods, if you can find a, a standard lot, they often go for five or six hundred thousand dollars, right? So that that's the you know if you if you think of trying to make affordable or accessible housing in these kinds of neighborhoods, if you're having to invest you know four hundred thousand dollars in the property itself, it's like well it's an impossibility. And so that was one of the premises of the of what we were trying to do is showing that there was attainable land because it was small, it was less expensive, and so consequently you didn't have this embedded cost that you had to get past in order to deliver somebody a home, you know, for, for a price that might be, you know, nearly reasonable anyways. But um, so that caught a little wind locally, and at about the same time the city figured out a way to sell a lot of surplus properties that they had. Longer story, but Turns out a lot of people started buying land because it was available. They found out the land was kind of small. They heard about us and they were calling like, hey, can you help us with this and so forth. So there's a little flurry that went along with it just as a consequence of, of, a, of a city doing something and, and our finishing a project about that same time. One of those that came, the, actually two of the projects I'm going to talk about came out of that um, series of events. The first one was quite interesting. It was a, a gentleman came to see us. Uh, uh, who had purchased a property that was really small, actually. It was like 30, what is it, 34 by 30, or by 25, 34 by 25. I forget the, well, I can tell you right now, the total area is about 992 square feet in terms of site. And then, uh, in, and, and uh, you know, contrary to what I said before, it's like we weren't really interested in building tiny homes or micro homes or any of these other things. This particular person was like, look, I bought this piece of property for $5,000. He was in Philadelphia at the time. He was moving to New Orleans and he wanted to make a small or a tiny home. Uh, and that 184 square foot home is actually the smallest permitted house in the city of New Orleans, as it turns out. So we ended up making a, a tiny home for him. He was a really interesting person, though, and this is what's been really, in, I will say, enriching about this process and this project. He was homeless. Uh, he was a military vet, and he had about $25,000 in the bank. He had enough money, $5,000 to buy the lot, and he had enough money left over from that to purchase the material for the home. And we worked with him on the design uh, and documentation and permitting and all that stuff of the project. And he spent nearly two years building it himself, essentially. Uh, and these are his notebooks. Uh, amazing. Uh, uh, these things you could sit and flip through, just phenomenal. But he documented everything, you know, leaves that he found and different species of trees, cartoons at the time that, you know, depicted what he, how he's feeling, I suppose, that day, lumber orders, material orders, all those things. And, um, it, it was a really fascinating process, um, and you know he was a person who was trying to leverage this sort of available resource in the way that we were trying to leverage it, and so we kind of worked through this process together. The idea was, is in a sort of tie into this agenda that we had, is like this was replicable, so the, we were going to make a, and, and kind of are in, still in the process of creating a set of instructions, if you will. He. Um, 
uh, is a, a, a really vocal advocate for housing, especially homeless housing, but, but individuals uh, uh, having access or the possibility of, of housing that might not otherwise, let's for uh, to be pretty generic there, but by, might not otherwise have access to it. He, he wanted to facilitate, you know, some possibility of them trying to, to and still does try to uh, advocate for that. And so part of this was like having a set of instructions. And so, you know, the whole thing, it, he had no power and no power tools too. So this was all hand done. He'd never built a home before. Uh, he, he knew a little bit of construction, but not much. And so that's hence the two years, but he, he ended up living on site while he was building the house, he, he crafted a, a bundle of two by fours, kind of carved out the center, and that became like his home, essentially. Uh, this person's phenomenal. He's such an incredible human being and, and really remarkable person, too. He just made the cover of our local uh, weekly kind of free fly, like free magazine. Uh, I'm sure you all have one here. Uh, but I walked into a coffee shop the other day, and he's his pictures on the cover of this thing. I'm like, oh my god, it's amazing. They uh, anyway, I, but often it, to kind of speed up here, I often like to say that we also made the ugliest house in New Orleans in some ways. It's very practical. The color of the home is uh, is actually what he got from our restore, the the habitat uh, 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 recycled material uh, store. The paint that day was this color because they blended everything together, so he picked up a few gallons of it, and that's the color of the house, right? His embellishments of the of the column there, he had found some scrap lumber, and, or sorry, metal, and kind of wrapped the column. Um, he, uh, again, very small home. The idea of this was a double. He was going to create another unit right next to it and use it as a rental and whatever, and so it's, it's actually a really amazing process. Uh, still ongoing, I should say. Um, uh, 4514 South Saratoga was another client. This, in, in this case, it was two doctors who had bought uh, uh, property, and they saw our house, visited us, and said, look, we're just going to give you this land. We're going to finance it. You guys go do what you do. And, um, and I often present this project and, and talk about it as a, as a tweak, if you will, slight, if not, at least for me, not insignificant tweak in, the, in our relationship with our client. So it's not someone coming to us with a scripted program uh, and, a, you know, here we, we like your work, but this is what we want you to produce for us. It was more of like they were coming to us, you know, full on, like we like what you do. We are here to sponsor you in a way to continue that development. Of course, it was their house, not to be mistaken. They were going to benefit from it, but it was just a, uh, you know, again, like a subtle tweak in the way, you know, work uh, runs through an office. Um, and, and this was, you know, an, an interesting project because it was, again, a small lot, 30 by 30, 35 by 30 foot deep. It was one that is the first, if I, uh, if I can say, like actual uh, uh, starter home, if you will. It's three bedroom, two and a half bath. It was around 1,500 square feet, so it felt like a normal house in a lot of ways. Still vertical, as you can see in sections, so three stories. The massing and the way we worked out the roofing was a way to kind of reduce that third floor and make it feel more like a two-story building. Uh, and then the way the, the material kind of wraps and, uh, and layers along the facade there was to... to uh, hide some of the scale of the house, and this was the inside of it, kind of looking all the way around. Uh, and this is it in the neighborhood. It, you know, the thing about New Orleans is that there's a, a certain density. I mean, I've I find it to be a very dense city. Um, it's just very horizontal, right? Like there's not a lot of things above one or two stories, and this thing's very vertical in this particular neighborhood, hidden perfectly behind that tree, though, from that angle. And then, uh, and then you can see you know, how you how it exposes itself around the neighborhood. And, and this gets into some of the architectural ambition here. It's like we're working within contexts that are, you know, historic. Uh, they, they have a quality and characteristic that we have a great affinity for. Like, we really love our neighborhoods in New Orleans, and we love, you know, the quality of the neighborhoods in New Orleans. And in and, and all their, you know, stylistic... Uh, 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 purity, if you will, but also just how funky they can be as well, right? And that there's just, you know, a nice mix of that. And, and we imagine this house, as the slide on the right shows, it's like it, it's having, you know, if you will, sort of a dialogue with with its particular context. Moving from that, the, the next project that we worked on, uh, St. Thomas and 9th Street, 4 through 15, this was one that we developed. Um, it's actually, and you'll see in some of the photographs, it's on land that's adjacent to the first house that we uh, that we worked on. As the story goes, uh, we built we were building the first house. The owner of this adjacent property, which was a larger lot, it's like twelve thousand square feet, is actually a decent size of land. 
uh, who had opposed our zoning change. So he was one of the most vocal people that were there, like, there's no way, you know, you're going to let these people change the zoning. So he helped kind of squish our, our aspirations around reducing our setbacks. Uh, but, but he came around as the building got underway, and he got a little more interested in what we were doing. And, and, uh, and, and he had this property, and over six to nine months, we convinced him that, you know, to sell it to us, essentially. And it was a vacant parcel and an old warehouse, uh, half of a warehouse, actually. Um, and when we started looking at it, we were going, okay, this is great. What are we going to do with this thing? If we want to do our model, we're looking for, you know, how do we subdivide the property? How do we create a lot, right? <laughs> and the way our subdivision ordinance is written in New Orleans, it's like, it, it really doesn't mesh with the way, I mean, like in a lot of municipalities, it doesn't mesh with the way the zoning ordinance works, and other, or not in the way we would like it to, let's say. But um, for this particular piece of land, if we were to subdivide it, we could get three houses on that lot. If we were to look at zoning, we could get 12 houses on the lot. And so what we, um, what we ended up doing was going, okay, you know, can we manipulate our subdivision regulations, which says August 1999 is actually more like uh, 1979. Um, uh, you know, like a lot of subdivision regulations in, in cities in the U.S. were written around the 70s and, and fairly conservative, uh, denser probably than, than Omaha's, but still, you know, big lots, you know, single house and so forth. Kind of gave up on trying to manipulate that. Ended up actually turning to uh, the condominium regime and using this as a legal instrument, if you will, to create the spatial and the the sort of living conditions that we were that we were trying to do with the architecture itself. And so now we've we've moved from architect developer into working through these legal documents to try to craft them in a way that. Um, uh, that reflected what we were trying to create again architecturally. So there was a you know a back and forth between this and what we were creating on site. Uh, some quick kind of massing diagrams. I'll, you'll see it uh, uh, as a completed project in a section. Second, this one started around 2015 or 2016 uh, planning. It finished. I think we sold the last unit in 2018, somewhere around 2018. Um, uh, so it's starting to age now, but this is a uh, kind of a massing diagram. The uh, upper left there just shows you the envelope that we could create, and then and then a series of like what we were trying to accomplish in terms of form and a relationship with the adjacent uh, with the adjacent context. This is just a, a quick plan of the site. I often say. Uh, you know, we designed all the housing around a parking lot, so we laid the parking lot out first and then everything else kind of stitched in around it. Um, we knew we could get 12 units. Um, we knew we needed 12 parking spaces, uh, which is, is an important to point out. Most, most of the development in historic neighborhoods don't require parking as long as it's a single or two family, so that first house I showed didn't need parking, but because this was technically multifamily, we had to work around that. So tight site, trying to get a lot of density on there in a detached form, right? So we weren't just creating a multifamily building and kind of dropping on the site. We were looking at creating individual houses, right? So again, the kind of detached single family home. Uh, this is the uh, plans for the uh, all levels as they go up. Not unlike the previous project, most of these are three stories. They're, they average 1,350 square feet, something like that. Most of them, uh, a couple of, or a few exceptions, but the majority of them are three bedroom, two and a half bath homes. Uh, some are really small, 915 square feet, but most are around that 1,300 square foot si uh, size. Um, the gray that you see there in the diagram was that first house that we did, so that's a kind of reference to that. And then the blue is the new development. And, and this is a diagram to show how we kind of transition around a corner uh, and what that looked like. And this is a, a quick kind of spatial diagram of like this layering of what was happening on the ground level, but also what was happening as you kind of moved through the different layer, vertical layers of, of the project and how things overlapped, spaces were created and so forth, model. Uh, and then this is the final project. Um, the, uh, if you can see right here, that was the first house that I showed you. So just for some context. And then this is the neighborhood, which you don't really get in those previous slides, but it's a transition zone. To the right in this slide would be the river. It's just off screen, uh, Mississippi River. And then, uh, you know, as you move left, you get into the more of the historic fabric. But this in-between zone was was light industrial for the most part. It historically was storage um, and so forth. and then it had, uh, and then, but also, you know, mixed in with the residential and so forth. So we were working in this kind of in-between space with this development. This is a, a series of uh, shots along that 
uh, along the ground level as you move around. So the, to the far left was the first house. This was that warehouse that was in the picture that had that uh, tan uh, metal on it. That we renovated that, so part of the project was the renovation of that warehouse. Uh, and then the rest were these single family homes, if you will, that went all around. And so the cutouts that you're seeing there are all the kind of entry porches, turning the corner here, parking, as I mentioned, kind of comes through this uh, throughway. And then that rear yard is really an important kind of public space for the complex. Uh, it's, it is the backyard for all of these, uh, even though it's parking, it's also the backyard for, uh, for all of the people that live there. It's, you know, dogs run around and so forth, kids and whatnot get to play back there and try not to get hit by cars, of course. Um, uh, but it's, a, it's an important sort of communal space for everyone that lives there. Th this is just a slide talking about the, the existing conditions around us that we try to pull into our projects, so the kind of using the space that, that those buildings form and how our buildings relate to that. Uh, and create new spaces. This is the, the porch and entry. Every is really important to us that each of these have a front door or at least a front porch. And so the, uh, so the connection between the home and the street, you know, where it was the kind of conventional front door, front porch way, that social space that's so important to us, especially in domestic uh, architecture. Um, uh, so you had these, uh, you know, this kind of contained porch area and then into the house. Inside the home, the proximity of each of these was, you know, it was, you know, they're there. They're right on top of one another in a lot of ways. And, and we embrace that. That's a uh, characteristic, I'd say, of, of conventional or traditional housing in New Orleans is kind of close proximity that I talked about earlier. We didn't worry about if windows aligned or didn't align. It didn't matter. It's like it's fine. Everything kind of laid on top of one another. Uh, but, but also how, you know, working through fenestration and, and the openness of the houses, how that pulled this neighborhood environment into the houses themselves. So what's around us becomes kind of a part of your lived experience there, too. Um, and then the last project, uh, I can run through this one quickly as well, is... Uh, 3609 36, uh, 3613 uh, South Saratoga. It was a house, uh, two houses that we developed on our own. Uh, no other partners. We were the only ones that were involved in it. Two lots um, that uh, it, it was, a, again, non conforming, not as small as some of the other ones, but still small. Uh, they were identical, and so we were working through, you know, what is, what does a house look like? How do you create two of the same but are different? And so this you know, thinking about the, the front of the home as the, as the you know, sort of stylistic uh, imprint of a house, whether it's Victorian, colonial, or whatever, um, but, but also the space that that front porch and that front, you know, that front space created was also an opportunity for us, this kind of layering possibility. And so we started working with different geometries and how those work together. When you stacked, uh, if, you, if you thought about the, in order to create what a, appeared on the surface of the house was actually a series of layers that cascaded through the front of the, basically through the front open space of the house itself, a little carport and an entry porch, and, and how we manipulated the distance between these layers is it's sort of theatrical in, in, a, in a way, right? Like you're just creating these scrims that when they all build together, they create a certain composition. Uh, and then with that in mind, when you had two of them together, even though they're identical, those layers are different, and so we we're just sort of subtly manipulating how you know one, uh, the depth of one and the depth of an, of another, but the the outermost sort of image of it, if you were to flatten it, was the same essentially. It's a model. We make a lot of little three D models. This is the completed project. This was it, um, and then we again we sold these. Well, I think these went through um, the pandemic has screwed up my brain like everyone else is around time but I think we sold these through the pandemic essentially and this is part of that layering that I'm talking about so these kind of planar conditions that extrude and, and kind of push through all the way up to the front door in this case but with each of these projects and kind of in closing with the starter home is that the projects in general is like there were we saw every one of these as an opportunity to kind of push back on different elements of of, of what housing development was both in New Orleans but but throughout the country and like what were the motivations what were the what were the things that we we thought were you know not necessarily aligned with the with the best possible outcomes and and some of that was what I talked about with the uh, looking at subdivision regulations which were you know they needed reworking but the only way to show that they didn't work was actually to make something using another method than 
you know, that you could say, hey, you know, if this permitted this and these are the possibilities that came from it. A another, another thing that we were really conscious of is like the role of development in general and who benefits from that. Uh, and the, what's important to us about this, these last two projects is that they were actually the first um, uh, equity crowdfunded projects in the country, a real estate equity real, crowdfunded real estate projects in the country, if I get that stacked right. They, uh, we, we actually crowdfunded for the, um, uh, for the equity we needed for the development loan for this project. And, and, and by crowdfunding, this was actually an investor model. So we actually got funds from about 38 different people that invested in our project. And when they sold, they got their money back, they got interest on that money, and they got a percentage of the return or the profits, let's say, off the project. Uh, which was an incredible, this is the page, we were looking for 90, not a lot of money, $95,000. Um, a lot of money to us, but not in the development world, not a, not a whole lot of money. The, the uh, $500 was a sort of minimum uh, deposit, and some people gave a lot more, some people just gave 500 but we had that many people that kind of rode along with us on the project, which was really an interesting experiment. We've tried it one more, once more on another project that I won't talk about tonight, but they, um, uh, and, and there again, like when we talk about aspirations, I think the aspirations of this program are really fascinating. The idea that in your own community, let's say you live in this neighborhood, you see that someone's developing something, uh, you have an opportunity to invest in that development if you believe in it or, or think it should happen, and you have an opportunity to profit from it, right? So it's not just someone coming in, selling something, and then going away that aren't part of the community. And to that end, like we had people that lived across the street that were investors in this, which was, I think, a, a proof of concept in some ways. We also had a lot of people from all over the country that were just interested, so, which was great. I could talk all night about this as well. It's just a fascinating thing. Um, the, and then from, from that project or those series of projects, it, it spawned a whole other series of like other opportunities that were, uh, that were kind of there and that we were able to act upon. Um, and, and work with others that were fascinated by the model that we were working on. And, um, and, and I'll run through these quickly, but I do like to say that, you know, the, the goal here was not just to talk about New Orleans, but talk about other cities and, and how, you know, this is an issue there and there are different ways to address it. Uh, Austin was one place we started working with a group who effectively asked us to go find small lots. It's like, okay, well, they kind of got the one-liner and they wanted us to, to comply with that or see if they could do that in other places. Houston was the same way. We studied Houston, came up with a lot of different options. All of these that I'm showing kind of petered out around pandemic time anyways. So, uh, but they were things that we studied for a while. Uh, Louisville was interesting. It was the first time we sort of had a chance to say, hey, listen, this wasn't about just about finding a small piece of property. It's about leveraging opportunities. Spent quite a bit of time working with a group, another not actually a nonprofit housing developer who was trying to rework uh, the Portland neighborhood, if you're familiar with, with Kentucky, Louis, excuse me, Louisville. Um, <clears throat> Long story, we started looking at all the different land banks and other organizations that were involved in this particular neighborhood, and we had kind of devised a way that you could leverage all of those entities into creating some kind of seed developments, and those seed developments respond additional development. Long story, I'll stay out of that. And then the, the last one uh, was Los Angeles, which was also, again, like trying to move beyond the idea that we're just there to find some small piece of property. Uh, the, uh, working with a group that said, "Hey, let's let's we've we've we know uh, that there are certain criteria that define the way uh, uh, spec builders, spec developers look at land in the hills, and, and and specifically that was topography. And and if a site had a certain percentage slope, then if it was above that, great. If it was, or sorry, if it was below that, great. It was it was." buildable land, if it was above that, then there's no way nobody touched it. And so they were like, listen, we think we know a way that we can construct on these properties, but we've got to find them. And so we did this whole analysis of like where we're looking at topography in this particular area and then like locating parcels for uh, under that criteria, which again was like just a different way of like thinking about opportunities and land opportunities. And, and these were all sites that you wouldn't otherwise know were there unless, you know, uh, that were legal, but, but just visually not apparent. <clears throat> So um, that, that series of, of projects, you know, again, thinking about the individual home as a way of talking about housing writ large and, and how you can, how, what housing development looks like and what are different opportunities around that. And mm, specifically thinking about how 
we create denser neighborhoods. Um, we find more opportunities, you know, to insert housing and in, in what otherwise might not be thought of as, as a, a place or possibility for housing. This next project was for a client of ours where <clears throat> similarly had bought kind of a funky site, uh, small, not terribly small, but smaller, and, and had an idea about like how do we actually generate a three-family house. I know this is radical, but like you could, most of the zoning in, uh, in New Orleans, like a lot of cities, it's one and two family and that's it. That's all you get unless you're in the urban areas. This is the most you can do. The work I was showing you before is kind of weaving around these uh, kind of customary uh, uh, light density, if you will, zoning regulations. This was a similar one. And so we started working with him on this kind of subversive three family. You know, like, okay, how do we squeeze another unit in here? Created a... a uh, started with a container. Uh, you wanted a container house, fine. We work with you on a container house, and then, but got that in place, and then we started working on these other the other components of it. Uh, and and I love showing this house because I I, uh, I think it sort of typifies a desire we have to create things maybe like Felicity that that aren't precious, right? They're not these perfectly crafted things but they're you know they they have like they wear they're they're rough and tumble and and they they fit in in a lot of ways what you don't see with the container which is part of this off in the distance there is a railroad track there's actually containers everywhere in this neighborhood when you drive around it's like well this just sort of is part of the context in a lot of ways I mean whether that was meant or not and so the rest of the development the wooden pieces all kind of build off of this tic tac -y, uh uh, ensemble that uh, that we started with with that container. You can see it here. That's the neighborhood uh, off in the distance there. Again, another historic neighborhood. Um, you know, and he parks his boat or his funny, you know, camper that he has and his beat-up truck and all that other stuff. And it's just like, again, just love the texture and the richness of this project. But it's actually quite beautiful on the inside, right? You've got this courtyard that these volumes kind of spin around. You see the light and the space that that creates. Uh, in this context, and then the kind of view out toward the rivers in the distance, you don't really see it, but it's uh, off in the, off beyond. Uh, and then in that, you know, as I said, I didn't go through the plan. Uh, it, the, the idea is that, okay, let's get a couple of houses in here, and then that third unit is actually a morphing of the some of the floor plan. It's basically taking one wall or adding one wall, and you've created that third unit. And so now he, he this is a three-unit development, essentially. Again, nothing radical there. It's just like looking for little ways that we can insert ourselves uh, in these areas. But, but from that, actually spawned uh, both the work that we were doing with Starter Home and the, our kind of push and pull with the zoning ordinance. Um, and little projects like this, um, you know, were, were all sort of like things that we were struggling with, but we weren't alone at some point, you know, you start meeting other people that are just kind of like, how do, how do we work within this fabric? And the city is also trying to figure out ways to introduce uh, additional density. They realize the, the necessity of, of trying to, to get more and, and less, essentially. And through that actually came a, a larger thing that we ultimately uh, uh, participated in the development of, which was a, a zoning ordinance that permitted four units of housing in, in a one-two family uh, uh, zoning district as long as there was an affordable unit. And this, this was like something the city worked really hard to implement is also we're seeing in a lot of other cities at the time, uh, Minneapolis and, and Portland are two. Uh, famous examples of this, but what was what was and this is the actual ordinance. If you really want to read that, I'll leave it up there for you later. Um, but the but what was compelling to us was like, okay, this is great. Now this is in place. Now what does that mean? And so unlike the starter home, we started looking at ways that we could create a prototype, if you will. So if those were non-prototypical, as I often say, we we were looking for a prototype that would work within these, uh, that would work in these typical lots. So there's your 30 by 120. Um, and so, but, but at the same time, like creating variation and offering, you know, opportunities or possibilities to insert different types of housing within that four unit development. And so we created this kind of, you know, uh, not kind of, we created a, a basic, you know, deck, if you will, of different housing types, and then we started looking at the variations, and again, I'm not going to leave that up here, but, like, looking at the different ways that these, you know, individual units could be on, you know, created or, or connected and, and located on site to create, you know, a unique configuration, but uh, configurations that were 
um, uh, kind of, uh, if you will, performa related or generated. If you wanted a four bedroom and a one bedroom and a two bedroom, they all kind of work on the site in certain ways. And the, and the magic for us was not, you know, the, the twisting back and forth wasn't just haphazard. It was creating in space for us that was important. It was the, it was the entryways. It was individualizing the unit instead of creating a single multifamily. Uh, and it also kind of played with the, an idea that we struggle with still is like, what is a detached unit? What is a four unit development? And that's important because it triggers a whole different set of, of uh, building code criteria. If it's a de detached single or two family, then it's the IRC, if y'all are familiar with that, International Residential Code. If it's a fourplex, then for us it triggers the commercial code, which meant sprinklers, it meant all the things that, that this kind of development can't support essentially. And so this really tentative like light touch was our way of saying that they were both connected and not connected. And so we were kind of testing the bounds of what it meant to be single and detached. And so anyway, this was us just sort of proving that you could fit all kinds of unit types on the site. So this was the configurations that we were working through and what that looked like. And what was important, as I said, was like the space that these were creating. It's like the objects didn't matter anymore. It was the, the, the space around the houses that, that mattered to us. And again, those were the, the zones of, of entry, but also, you know, private outdoor space. Uh, and, then, and then also, you know, ways of, of making a unit or someone's home legible uh, within this form. And so this kind of wacky spatial diagrams that we got into, but you know, they were three dimensional things. And so the thinking about how they stacked on site and what they look like, but they were envisioned as like the dumbest rectangle you could think of with like a hip roof, right? And the real energy and the development is like how they all connected and, uh, and the uh, dynamism, if you will, of, of their relationship with one another. And so th this is something we're working on now, actually. And so we're, we've been chasing lots for this development. We've got a few people that we're talking through and kind of working, talking with and working through now on this development uh, model. Um, but when we think about density and we think about housing, another project um, that we've also been working on for a while now is, is for an organization, First 72 Plus. So again, not something that we are doing on our own, but working with a partner, and in this case, an organization that provided reentry housing uh, for uh, uh, formerly incarcerated in individuals. Uh, they were actually trying to figure out a housing model that reflected their or that worked, I shouldn't say reflected, that worked with their organizational model, which was which is basically providing services to individuals as they left. So it wasn't just about housing, it was providing the things that someone needed in order to transition from that environment, incarceration, into, you know, back into the public realm, right? And so their model involved, you know, all of those, or providing all of those pieces, and they were looking for some way or another to make sure that, or figure out how that could happen in one home, essentially. And so what we began working with them on is this idea of, like, you know, what, is a, what does a two-family house really mean? And in this case, it becomes sort of a, an eight-bed transitional housing. So this is sort of blending the, you know, our, our conventional notions of what a home is or even a two-family home is into something that's completely different but stitched within that same context. It was really important to them that they didn't just create one large, there's a, and I'm not getting into this, but there's a major need. Like, they need thousands and thousands of these things. At the time when we started working with them, they had six beds for people. And, uh, and I think there's a statistic in here. I think the, the governor at the time had just done a, a release program, and there were between 20 and 30,000 people that were released all at once, and there were six beds in the whole state available to them. And so this organization tried to figure out what can we do. They did not want to concentrate housing, so kind of replicating the, a model of, you know, we're going to put everybody together in one place. They wanted to decentralize or deconcentrate. And so part of our work with them was like thinking about how you could distribute this, if, if not only diagrammatic, diagrammatically, but literally throughout the neighborhood. So you were moving back into a community and not into a housing complex. Uh, but they had a site that we started working on as the kind of prototype, if you will. It, it was adjacent their office spaces and the, and the beds that they had. Uh, this was a little plan. This was us looking at program and like how we, this is a conventional lot, you know, the 30 by 120 that we work with, you know, how does all that program fit on this particular site? Massing analysis that we were doing, like how do you, 
you know, a lot of our work at this scale when we're trying to get a lot in a, in a small amount of space is working through scale and trying to disguise some of the, the actual heft of a project. And so this is us working through different form and roof types to make that look. And then this is the finished project. So this wrapped up, uh, I believe, last year, uh, middle part to the end of last year. Uh, and um, was completed then and it is now in fully in use. And, and this image is uh, both descriptive of the project but also kind of tells you a little bit about context. What you see in the distance there is actually the parish jail. So that's how they are right next to their constituents in some ways. In fact, people yell down at us and everything else from the jail when we're when we're out there, but this was the home. And I mean, and, and the, the other side of this and what was important to the organization, it's like, yes, they could have just put up any old thing and it would have worked, but they, it was important to them that they provided, you know, the kind of care and, and, and quality around design and, and, and thoughtfulness around space for, you know, the people they were working with in the, in the same way that all of us want that, right? So they were, is really important to them that, you know, this was, the best thing that they could make for somebody. This is the uh, this is a completed project. Um, uh, the first 72, you can see the sign there is their offices, and and in the back, that's also more jail and federal stuff in the distance. So that's the context that they're in. This was a completed project. The the two, uh, or sorry, the side of the the finished project. The the two units. So this kind of double. This was single two family zoning. The the two family here has been emphasized. They're actually kind of detached. Uh, with a little thin uh, connector piece in the center. The idea is that you could actually cut off one from the other uh, if you wanted to, and that little sliver with a window there kind of diminished. Um, and then, you know, but the, the forms aren't, I should say, uh, arbitrary either. It's like it with, you know, as I, I mentioned in the previous projects, it's like there was a real desire for this project to fit and have a dialogue with the, with the residential housing that was all around it. And so this kind of dynamic thing popping up, similar roof or similar material and, uh, and geometries, but, but clearly different, right, in this case. Um, another another project that looks at again insertion and opportunities of, of uh, develop uh, single family housing development in this case in Memphis and and this is and this is also to illustrate the different ways we work and so it's not always about us designing and building something in this case we worked with the uh, organization MMDC Memphis Medical District Collaborative which was the uh, uh, a uh, uh, com community development organization. Um, uh, that actually a corporation that <clears throat> was in charge of a kind of a large swath around the medical district in Memphis there were and what they were looking for from us was some kind of manual that they could take to the community to individuals that were interested in developing or investing uh, whether they lived there or they were coming to the neighborhood uh, and, and illustrate to them the process of doing that. So this, in, in a lot of ways, this was their zone that they worked in. This was the fabric. I'll get back to what I was trying to say in a second. This is where we were working, sort of bungalows, some vacancy. Um, but it was it was meant as kind of an instruction guide. So we worked through what the parameters are, you know, zoning. Like this is the thing you need to think about, you know, lot sizes, where you park, where you don't park, uh, front yards and side yards. So we were trying to illustrate to someone who had, perhaps never thought about building a house or, or developing a home with that, things that they needed to think about. Here's that equation again. It's, uh, you know, thinking, you know, through the, the economics around development and trying to describe that. Uh, and, then, and then talking about what, you know, development or what, you know, density is and, and what some opportunities were around, you know, it didn't just have to be a single house, what were the other things. But then also there's a kind of line of this that were, that were more, um, what I would say is like, um, uh, we, we, we had a, a certain disposition that we were trying to enforce on anyone who uh, happened to be or thought about developing in the neighborhood and it's just thinking about like let's be smart about the kind of house that we build it doesn't have to be a typical house it could be a little tighter and there were some advantages of that thinking about how one design might fit in multiple locations but but also understanding that development is evolutionary and like you do one thing and you don't want to close out the possibility of doing something in the future and so we talked a lot about putting in infrastructure for additional development over time and so again we're just like this is a handout this is something that somebody could read and like go okay this is what this is what I need to be thinking about this gets back into some design uh, uh, 
issues that we're really interested in are the idea of the facades that you've seen already in some of the other projects and what one sees or perceives from the street versus what a house is, which is a unit, as we like to say. It's like it's kind of the dumb part of housing. Uh, and then, you know, looking at context and trying to build from that. And so we took those similar uh, uh, forms and that we were looking at and started to kind of create sort of cheeky names for what we were looking, you know, the the floored and ordered, right, and all that stuff, whatever that's supposed to mean, the sibling step and whatnot. But we, you know, we were just trying to like characterize the housing in a way that it, that was different than just going this, it had columns and it had a roof. It's like, well, what are, what are we talking about really? And then, and then with that in mind, it's like creating, um, uh, if, if there are learning from Las Vegas, um, references here but the you know thinking you know okay what's what's important here and what should you should be emphasizing and we created a series of designs for that in the book and so this is a single family two or a single family with an ADU a two family uh, fourplex that's split and then an apartment building even what that looks like in that context the um, <clears throat> uh, it's been an interesting project and so the advocate MMDC has has you know, really been pressing this throughout the neighborhood. Out of those four or rather five different proposals, we now have done four of them. So one's under construction, the other three are underway. We probably have another 15 to 20 different projects out of this that people now, they, uh, MMDC sort of directs them to us to sort of take it to the next level if they want to. And so, and you know, sometimes we're working with people with multiple properties, sometimes it's just an individual that it's the lot they bought next to them. And so it's been a really, Fascinating, and again, like just pressing the models and the ways that we work and, and being willing to sort of explore uh, those different relationships and, and what it means to make buildings. Um, the last project, or the project I'm going to end with, is, you know, again, in the same vein as the, as the work that I've talked about thus far, but a little different in that it's, it's not a singular insertion that we're talking about, but it's a larger, like, how do you build community and how do you build it around this, you know, unit, the one, two family house. Uh, the organization uh, um, is uh, called Bastion. They are actually another nonprofit. We work, if, if it hadn't caught on already, we work with a lot of nonprofits uh, in our community and elsewhere uh, that had a specific mission to create a, a community for post 9 11 uh, combat veterans with long term disabilities and to uh, uh, develop a model that em embraced and, and uh, facilitated a community health care. Uh, uh, scheme essentially so it was like how to how do members of this constituency work live together and help one another at the same time and so um, they had a large piece of land they were able to purchase uh, in Gentilly this is a post-war you know 1950s development just outside of downtown to the north close to the lake um, a lot of slab on grade stuff uh, again you know small kind of ranch burger houses um, that are atypical, I'd say, for New Orleans. Um, but the site was vacant when we when we were there. But it was vacant. Also, thinking about in, embedded, you know, context here, it was vacant uh, only because it was uh, adjacent to one of the flood wall breaches uh, during Katrina. So this is a London Avenue canal to the left. You see that vertical line. You'll see in the photographs in a minute. There was a breach just to the left of that dotted sign, so that middle uh, slide, you can see how much flooding there was around that. Previously, it, it had multifamily housing on the site. It, the core tore everything down, used as a staging site for the repair of the flood wall. Uh, they left the trees. And so they had basically five and a half vacant uh, acres of vacant land with all these beautiful oak trees. We started working with them on what some organizational models look like. Uh, and then, and then, kind of recognized that they were looking for a certain density on this site, so they wanted, you know, ba basically what you would expect in a multifamily, you know, traditional multifamily development. But, but it had to, for a number of reasons, kind of exist in this low-scale two-family, uh, uh, two-family uh, development model. And so, uh, it's it is affordable. This was a LIHTC development. Uh, we were working with a developer uh, in addition to the nonprofit, so there was a number of, of parties involved here. Um, but we went about kind of working through a, de uh, a development pattern and scheme for them that's laying out the site, creating parcels actually, so each of these houses sit on an individual parcel even though it's, it's a larger rental community. 
uh, and then kind of working through different phases of its development. All the black that you see uh, on this diagram is built now, and you'll see in photographs in a second. There are, I think, let's say roughly 60, uh, 60 units of housing on this site. The area, uh, the grayed out area with the, with the skewed uh, rectangles uh, and squares is the third phase of development where actually we just went out to bid on a building that goes on that site. This is also a project we started in 2014. It's now 10 years later and we're probably in the middle of the development, I would say. It's just one that we've, we've continued to work with and to, to kind of help, you know, see it through. So this is it. This is the development in the canals to the right. Uh, this is the neighborhood in the context. Um, and that vacant section of land uh, is where that third phase is and where we're working to uh, working right now. And, w and what's so the, the site is all housing. There's some small community uh, facilities um, uh, and the headquarters of the nonprofit or their offices are all on site. What we're making now in the third phase, which I wish I had images of, uh, are um, or, or is their headquarters essentially. And so there's an organization that that prioritized for the first 10 years of its operation uh, how they could help their local community. In other words, the people that lived on site. Uh, they've, uh, we started it, working with them in 2014. I think construction started on, in 2017, 2018 on the first phase. We may have finished the second phase maybe around 2020, I forget the date, and now, you know, again, we're moving into the third phase. But the, with this third phase, the, the idea is that now they're opening themselves up to the rest of the city, and so we've created a, uh, what they call a wellness center where uh, anyone in the neighborhood, or excuse me, in the New Orleans uh, area and region, uh, are, are, it's open to them for, uh, for similar services that, they, that they've been doing with, uh, with their own residents. Uh, over the last few years. And then the rest of the, that's part of the site. The rest of the site will actually be transitional housing. So there, there's now a desire to try to address uh, 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 specifically female, uh, home, uh, uh, unhoused females, uh, because there are no facilities in the city for that right now. And so that's our next, you know, that's phase four essentially, is like working through what that looks like on the site and as part of this larger community. So more, more to go on that one. Uh, quickly, this um, uh, the layout is really important from you know a number of different reasons. It's like the I'll get into it, but the housing is sort of the dumb part, and the organization of the site is the smart part, I would say, and how these uh, houses uh, work to kind of weave around the existing the existing oak trees, but also create this pattern uh, and and. Uh, kind of spatial boundary, if you will, around the perimeter, porous spatial boundary around the perimeter, and uh, form this large communal green space in the center. So this large, this lawn that you're seeing in picture here is their, is their community lawn. This is, you know, it from grade level essentially. Uh, and then these are the houses. Uh, they're, they're all, there's actually, I'll get into this in a second, there's actually only two types that we work with, um, two building types that we work with, and, and the uh, and, and what we did was just sort of mix and match those, uh, for the most part, moving them, you know, in different ways in plan, but also flipping them and, and configuring them in different ways. And I look at this, and, and you know, at the end of this talk, it's like I just realized how idiotic some of this stuff is. It's like all the effort that goes into this in order to create this sort of pattern and, and fabric that mattered to us, but, like, every one of these were unique, right? So it wasn't just one thing we repeated, even though I'm presenting it that way. It's like... Every set of drawings we did were all different as a consequence. But they, the, the point of the, the, the organization, aside from what I described, is trying to create a, a com, in, uh, uh, an interior that was about community and, and a place to congregate. The relationship between the units themselves was critical. And it, this was actually something that they workshopped through uh, people that uh, were... Uh, uh, were interested in living here or were the right kind of candidate to live here, they work through, uh, you know, a, a series of questions and, and engagements around how and, and what made the most sense in terms of uh, social structure, like when it comes to housing, like how many people do you want around you to where you feel supported but not kind of overwhelmed and, and can kind of recede and be anonymous. And so you, want, you didn't want too little and you didn't, didn't want too much. And so this kind of idea around having four units work together was really important. So the fourplex kind of comes back into play here. 
Uh, and, and the way we work that out is actually taking these two units and then just turning them in on themselves to create a, you know, what became the shared courtyard space for these four units, housing units. And so this is an illustration of that. The other thing was is that there were no front doors, as you'll see. Um, they, uh, we didn't want one unit to have sort of priority over one space or the other, be it the street or the community space. We were looking for something that was a little more democratic, so everybody kind of opened into the center space, and you had equal access either to the outside or to the inside of the, of the property. This is one of those units. The forms are kind of mute on the outside, and we use vibrant colors on the inside, as you can see, so pinks and blues, the trees kind of fitting their ways in their greens. Uh, in this case, and then this is one where you can see we kind of spread them out a little bit to allow this tree to, to stay. I don't know how many oaks were on there. I think we ended up cutting down one because it had termite damage, but otherwise everything stayed, which is great. Um, and th this kind of silhouette was really important to us. So we went through all these different versions of like what is the right shape for this house. Uh, in, in how, you know, as I said, the two uh, porches come together to create that internal volume, the, the courtyard or the court space for those two, but, but how this kind of uh, form was, was both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time, so it was idiosyncratic, um, uh, but, but with a, a, de a degree of ambiguity around it too, it's like what is it exactly, and the windows were a thing, and then the, this wooden fence that you see that kind of plays into the geometry is where the condensing units and the trash cans go, but we used that as an opportunity to kind of reinforce some of the shapes we were working with. And, and this is the end shot to the right um, is that vacant lot that or vacant part of the site that we're working on right now. But you can kind of see it in profile here. Again, no front doors, so you don't really know what it is. There's a, uh, a grade relationship that we're also working on. These things are elevated, so they're kind of four or five feet off the ground, and we still wanted them to feel connected so they didn't feel like they were floating on sticks, essentially, which is basically what they are. Um, the, uh, the construction method, which is what we're showing here, was really simple, as you might imagine, you know, just stick framed everything. Uh, the, the, we use driven piles for all of our foundations in New Orleans, and in this case, we, we instead of doing, say, piles and a grade beam, uh, with CMU on top of it, which is, which is a conventional um, foundation type, we actually just let the, these timber piles kind of extend or cantilever out of grade, and then we banded it and just built right on top of that right on top of that deck and the advantage there was is that around all of these trees we weren't cutting out root structure we were just sort of poking holes you know the best thing we could do through the roots and so we were able to build right next to some of these trees like in fact we were so close in some cases we had to notch this porch area so that limbs could kind of make their way through uh, but the truss was really important and and so this you know as, as I come to the end here it's like also thinking about tectonics and materiality is important to us um, the uh, uh, no granite, no Endicott tonight. Sorry, but a lot. But we really, uh, uh, but we, but you know, using the the kind of techniques and the materials that that are at the, the you know that are the uh, material palette, if you will, for this kind of housing is again like we, something that you know we're very intellectual about and we like to engage with. And, you know, in this case, using that truss is kind of an inexpensive way to create difference in all of these uh, units. And so that section, as you move through that extrusion, if you will, is actually, we sort of save the, the energy for the inside. So every unit has a different spatial profile in the, in the ceiling plane. So we created these vaulted conditions all the way down in that big space allowed us to get some really high uh, volume. So when you're in it, you're not in a shoebox. Like we didn't want to create housing that was just generic. And um, it, we were trying to find something that, you know, had, a, a, again, a little more spirit to it and, and that people could sort of connect to and, and feel like someone cared about them as a consequence. It, it also provided attic space and, and a number of other things. And this is it sort of, as you can see, it kind of laid out across the site in that case, and then different images. And so this sort of moving things around created the, you know, this kind of layering, you know, so you did, you saw into the site and you saw multiple units as they kind of pulled you into the block itself. Uh, and as that made its way around the neighborhood, the kind of little window being a bit bedroom, a big window being a living room that kind of faced out to the street. Um, and then this is kind of the end shot of the, uh, again, more of these units and how they tie into one another. And given that I'm past my time, I think I'm going to end it uh, there and say thank you, everybody, for listening tonight. So. <clears throat> thank you.
you have one or two. Yeah, and, and please, if y'all, I'll run through this, I think, quickly. This probably felt like forever for y'all, but the, um, if y'all have questions about anything, I'm here to answer, so I can't see them. Please. Thank you. question it's uh, and I also realize I'm, I'm a little vague about our role in some of the work and like how it, it works and I start out with us being developed look at us we're developing these things the, the majority of our work is not development driven and that's a small piece of it and to, to say something to that one point um, the uh, but but we find it as a form of advocacy really important to us so I'll, I'll get back to that the but and also to make a point of the kind of hurdles or the or whatever you want to, hills that we had to climb for the zoning, like to us that was the fun stuff, right? Like the, you know, fig, you know, because it is often sort of taken for granted. It is what it is. But you know, being imaginative in that realm, especially at this scale, you know, if you're working on a big commercial project, you're always sort of trying to figure this stuff out. But you know, in the in the realm that we were working, like looking for you know, possibilities was a, like, that was thrilling to us. Like, oh, wow, look what, we could do this or we could do that. And at the time we were doing it, I would say uh, our city in particular, although they understood the need uh, to create density and a desire to create density, they, they weren't actively doing anything. That's one reason why I think it's important to show that one, that one series of projects where we talk about the small multifamily and the change in zoning, what we were trying to do with our own work was advocate for those kinds of changes for what it's worth. And so that subdivision ordinance that I said sucked uh, was actually uh, rewritten as a consequence of that one project that we did. So we, we had an impact and that mattered to us, right? Like that was really important. And so we, we saw where there were deficiencies, but we also saw where there were possibilities. Like dumb stuff, like nobody knew you could build on these little lots. It's like, well, of course you can. It says it right there, but nobody sort of went, you know, they always say, well, there's no way you can. It's like, well, there, yeah, you can. It says it right there. It's just things like that. That was fun to us. So it was definitely sometimes a, a hill to climb, but it was also what empowered us, I think, through the process. In terms of funding, uh, the uh, starter work was intentionally market rate. Unsubs there were no subsidies. It's, and the crowdfunding was, was just investor model, right? Like that's just giving, you know, asking somebody for investment funds. Uh, we, we were intentionally outside of the realm of any, um, uh, any assistance in, in that case. And, and partly because we just weren't set up for it. You know, we didn't know how to go after, or we couldn't go after LIHTC or those other things, but also because we wanted the challenge of just working in that system, right? Where there was, you know, everything was market driven, which drove a whole lot of decisions in ways that I don't have time to describe tonight, but it was a piece of it. In terms of aid and where other funds come from, uh, you know, LIHTC is an important model that, and, or, rather uh, incentive, let's say, for affordable housing. We do a lot of LIHTC development, but that's a fairly routine thing. I mean, if that's what you do, that's what you do. Um, it, it is, you know, we probably recognize more of the limitations around it now and like what it doesn't, it doesn't allow the experimentation that, um, that you can do without it. And that's one benefit of going market rate is like you don't have the same structures that you have to adhere to. Um, so we shy away from that in a lot of ways. Um, it, the the work that we're doing that I didn't present tonight now around housing is actually creating 
economic models that are uh, regenerative. So we've got catalytic projects, uh, or one that we're working on in particular, if I can just describe in the abstract, is like you create a development, uh, let's say conventional or traditional multifamily development, but the way you structure the operating cost and, and where rent goes, uh, we are creating a, um, uh, basically a housing trust out of that. So anyone who rents can then go purchase uh, they have a down payment, they have access to mortgages and so forth. So that's a whole kind of systems approach that is so like unresolved. I don't even talk about it right now, but that's the one that we're that we're really interested in right now. So in terms of funding models, like that's kind of where we're headed. There's a there's a lot of stuff that we work with that developers bring to the table, but if you're asking us what we're doing, we're looking for that. And it also involves philanthropy, right? So we're now, you know, talking to foundations about helping with that. So that's another big piece of what we're interested in if that answers everything. <clears throat> affects us personally, it, it is uh, truthful. I mean, six times seems like a lot. I don't know what those increments were. I mean, insurance goes up every year, but what I will say we've seen in the last two or three years, like a threefold increase in insurance. So it's like, no shit. It's really like, it's increasing. And that's, that's a big thing. Um, there, I mean, it, that, that is a problem that I don't know how to solve because I can't keep a hurricane from hitting New Orleans, right? And, uh, and, and that sounds flip, I don't mean it to be, but that, that is the, the sort of, and we're all familiar with this, the kind of dynamics around an industry that involves betting on risk, right? And at some point they realize it's too risky and so they don't want to be involved. That's state level politics that are trying to figure out at the same time. Uh, I, I think our role in that as, as architects or, or even as developers is like what are the kinds of things we're making now that address what are known certainties around how what is going to happen to our environment and how we're going to have to live in this particular community. And I think, you know, an overused term resiliency is really important. And so we definitely care about that uh, in, in the uh, and and this, the strength of housing, but but also like things that we really are proponents for these days are also, and this is strange for us because we typically aren't, but like certifications, uh, fortified home is a big one for us because we know, and this is engagement in that, uh, in the insurance policy world, it's like those are the kinds of things that insurance companies are looking for now for a home that has been certified under this program that says it's been, you know, designed and, and uh, but also kind of qualified that it meets those parameters. And so it, it one, it, it just helps insuring something generally. And so, you know, there's a possibility that things just aren't going to get insured anymore. And so having that as like, you know, that as a criteria that you can check off on makes it a more insurable home or commercial building. Um, Th those are the kinds of things that we advocate for now, the clients, like the one at, the thing in Bastion is not a requirement, this is the next project at Bastion, uh, was, it's not required that it be fortified. And y'all may not be familiar with it, but it's a rating system that it's uh, is it basically, uh, it revolves around reducing loss after a wind event. So it could be tornadoes, but it's really like coastal regions is what it's, uh, what it's focused on. Tornadoes are tough. Um, the, the, uh, and, and so we, we try to, like with Bastion, we're like, I know you don't need to do this, but you need to do this because your insurance agent's going to care about this, and let's make sure that we cook it into the design of this. Uh, and, and our clients don't know the value of that, but we know that they will know the value of that in the future. And, and again, that's, you know, our own personal experience, but also like talking to insurance agents and trying to like be aware of, of where uh, their heads are so that, you know, the best we can, we can kind of adapt and address that in our work. Um, but it's a big problem. And, and your driver was right. I appreciate you saying that. It's just tough. But I mean, it's not just New Orleans. It's, you know, all coastal Florida and it's working its way to the north too. 
<clears throat> the um, the uh, he's trying. He's going to have a hook and pull me off of the stage in a second. The um, one, one more. One more. One more. The. Uh, uh, sorry, the budget for the for the smaller or what? Sorry, what was the what led us to build and design the tiny homes? Is that the question? The uh, sorry, um, the well, what I'll say is like we weren't interested in building tiny homes. None of the houses that we developed, with the one exception, is quote a tiny home. And uh, I mean, we get they get small, but like 900 square feet is not a tiny home. And and, and in fact, uh, just anecdotally, it's like when we built that first house, uh, which was 975 square feet, we we got some local press where they all called it a tiny home, like new tiny home in the or or whatever they called it, small house in the or tiny home, let's say in. Uh, uh, in the Irish Channel, we started getting all this like hate email saying this is not a tiny home. Like, why are you calling it a tiny home? It's like we're not. I promise that was not. We did not say that. And so, uh, which I didn't say, but the the qualifier that I often for the Felicity Project is like, well, somebody asked us to do the tiny home, so it's like, okay, we're going to do the tiniest home that you can permit, basically. So, um, which nobody called a tiny home for some reason. That's but that's it. <clears throat> that's it. No, all right. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you all very much. Um, yeah. <clears throat>。It turned on. Okay, there we go. Sorry, um, you're tall, so I had to take it off of there. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Sorry, um, if you do have questions, I will say Jonathan is super uh, reachable through email. Um, the guy, like, will respond instantly. Um, so if you have some burning questions that um, we weren't able to get to tonight, please reach out to him. Um, again, thank you for coming out. Our next lecture will be April 4th. Um, and it'll be Shane Darwin. He's actually a fine artist from Oklahoma City. Um, he's also doing a residency with Maple Street Construct in conjunction with his lecture. Um, him and his wife who are both artists, um, but he does a lot of um, art that's in the architectural realm and architectural scale. So it should be a great um, uh, lecture that's adjacent to architecture. Um, again, if you need uh, CEU credits for AIA, they uh, please scan one of the... AI Nebraska QR codes, and then I just beg you to please um, scan one of the um, attendee surveys uh, for Benson Community, or Benson Creative District. It helps us with our metrics and for funding for next year. So thank you everyone for coming out. Appreciate it.